And his greatest work was there on the cross, as Brother Monty reminded us, pouring out his life, his life's blood, his, his life for us. Celebrating the new covenant, or we might say the last supper. All, you know, we're Baptists, aren't we? So uh, we all like a good meal. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> uh, and so... Um, we see this morning in our passage that as we are uh, running through Mark, we're going to be done before too long, by the way. And uh, we're going to jump into the one another's. If you uh, will pick up your uh, August newsletter out there and it'll give you the sermon titles that will be coming after we finish the Gospel of Mark. We're going to look at the one another passages, the one another commands in the New Testament. There's uh, seven or eight, or actually there's more than that, but we're going to look at seven or eight of those as a, as a church. And, and, uh, but but uh, on the night before <coughs> Jesus was crucified, he gathered his closest followers together to eat his, his last meal. And uh, this supper... We call it the Lord's Supper, or we are about to do what we would call the Lord's Supper, the, the communion. This supper was, was so rich in spiritual meaning uh, because it goes all the way back into the book of Exodus, if you remember the first Passover, because that's really what they were doing, is they were celebrating the Passover meal. Jesus' last meal was the Passover meal. This was an annual uh, meal that was commemorating a definite point in the history of God's people, in the history of Israel. It was celebrated the same way uh, every time, every year. And so Jesus was set on celebrating this supper, and he was, he was eager to to explain the meaning that was behind this final meal that he was having. And at the heart of this supper, the, the Passover was designed to celebrate the temporary, remember, the temporary deliverance or salvation that came through the blood of the spotless lamb, the Passover lamb, if you remember uh, what happened. They had uh, been under bondage. They had been slaves for 400 years. And when God, the night that God was to deliver them, he had sent nine plagues and he sent the tenth plague and it was called the plague, the death of the firstborn, the death angel. But God had told his people, he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a little lamb, a spotless lamb, couldn't have any blemish, any, had to be a spotless lamb. Take it into your home, treat it just like you would your little puppy dog, like a pet. And then on that evening, he said, I want you to slit its throat and take the blood and catch it. And you take something and you, you plaster that blood on the doorpost of your house. And God says, tonight at midnight, I'm going to send my death angel. And every house that has the blood on it the death angel will pass over that house. It was called the Passover lamb, that little lamb. He was the Passover lamb. But every house where the blood was not found, the firstborn in that family would die. And that's what happened. And while there was great weeping and wailing in Egypt of all these firstborn who had died, the children of Israel were delivered. But this was a temporary deliverance. It was a picture. Jesus is now going to initiate a new meal that celebrates what I want to say the timeless salvation, the timeless deliverance that comes through the blood of the sinless Lamb of God. Can you say that with me? The sinless Lamb of God. The sinless lamb, the blood of the sinless lamb of God. Each element of the Passover meal was very symbolic 
Uh, the unleavened bread, as I mentioned last Sunday, was represented the, the, the haste in which they left Egypt. They had been slaves for 400, but that night they left quickly, and so they had unleavened bread. It didn't have time to have to rise. It was unleavened bread. Then the, the, uh, the bitter herbs. Um, there were some bitter herbs in the Passover. It reminded them of the pain and the agony and the slavery that they had been under for 400 years years. And then there was this um, uh, paste-like puree, puree that was prepared to, to, to look like clay. That was to remind them of all those bricks that they had made throughout those 400 years. The hard labor that they had done. And then of course there was the, the Passover lamb that re helped them to remember God's merciful uh, Passover, passing over them. And then there was the wine that symbolized the, the blood that they put on their doorposts of their house. But this night was different. Jesus met, th met there in that upper room that he had had prepared, that they'd gone ahead and, and fixed. And he began as the heavenly host there and he pronounced... Um, a blessing. You look at verse 22 and it says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, some of that unleavened bread, and he blessed it and he broke it. And very interestingly, everything changes. <laughs> everything changes. Can somebody say everything changes? Everything changes. He picks up this bread and, and Jesus as the bread of life who was born in Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. And now he holds up this bread and he blesses it. And as he blesses it, what Jesus says next, no doubt, stunned these disciples. Off script. <laughs> this was not the Passover anymore. Jesus said, Take. This is my body. Now, did he literally mean his literal body? No, his, his literal body was standing there in front of him. <coughs> this is my body. Take, this is my body. This wasn't in the script, or, or was it? <laughs> With these five words, take, this is my body, Jesus broke from the Jewish tradition that had lasted for hundreds, for centuries. And now he was saying, by breaking this bread and saying, take, this is my body, Jesus is saying that I have taken on humanity. Jesus was broken on the cross as our substitute when he gave himself for us. He gave his body for us. Jesus blesses this bread and then, then it says he gives thanks for the cup. That word cup there is the word Eucharisto. We get the word Eucharist from it. He blessed the cup. And then notice what he says. Verse 24. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many. Wow. Again, Jesus startles his disciples. You see, that, that cup, that cup represented his violent and bloody death that, he, that was about to happen in just a few hours which inaugurated the new covenant that Jeremiah had prophesied. In Jeremiah 31, 31, uh, Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. According to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission, Hebrews 9, 22 tells us. And then Peter 
adds this in 1 Peter 1, 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. But he says, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Folks, don't miss this. Don't miss this this morning. The angel of death only passed over those homes where the blood of the lamb had been applied. Think with me. Follow me. Likewise, unless you have applied the blood of the lamb to your life, the Bible says you will die in your sins. Have you believed in Jesus, in the blood of Jesus Christ who washes away, from, washes away our sins? Have you applied the blood of the Lamb? It's only where the blood is applied, by faith. There's two practical principles that we get here about the Lord's Supper. In verse 25, Jesus said, Surely I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new. In the kingdom of God. Two quick, what I want to call practical principles here. The bread that he broke and the cup that he served were memorials of his death. You see, they, when we partake of the Lord of communion in just a few minutes here around this table... That bread and that uh, juice is not going to somehow mystically become the body and blood of Jesus as some teach. No, no. It is it's a memorial. This is a memorial. It's something to help us to remember. That's why we do it often. We probably don't do it often enough. You know, some churches do it every Sunday. But maybe sometimes that's too much. You kind of get into a, just going through the motions. But, but every time we do it, it is a memorial. We are remembering his death. We're not repeating a sacrifice. <laughs> Scripture is very clear that Jesus has completed his sacrificial work on our behalf. And our response is simply to repent and believe that he died as a substitute for our sins. And if we repent and believe, we are saved. Our sin, we've been covered by the blood of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, once for all. We're not repeating it. We're not, when we're doing this, we're not repeating what Jesus did. It's once for all. He's already done it. He's already done it. Jesus not only changes things up in this ceremony they were in, but he also says some things that, that messed up the disciples. He, he messed them up good. He gives two predictions. Look at the, look at the words that follow. Verse 28. What does he say? You're all going to desert me. Now we know from other gospel records that Judas has already left to do his deceitful deed by this time. And now Jesus tells the disciples that they will all desert him. Verse 28. The word there literally means to fall away or to fall into sin. He's quoting actually Zechariah chapter 13 verse 7 when he says... God says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So it's not Judas. Get this correct, folks. Get this theology right. It's not Judas. Um, it's not the religious leaders. It's not you. It's not me that killed Jesus Christ. Fast forward. Look down at verse 50. Then they all forsook him and fled. Prediction fulfilled. Who killed Jesus? God says, I will strike the shepherd. It was God's plan. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. God's plan of redemption. 
Jesus had to die. If he hadn't died, none of us in this building would have any hope of eternal life. We would, we're all sinners. We, we, we all deserve to go to hell. Or as the old preacher used to say, split hell wide open. That's all. If it wasn't for Jesus. But Jesus died. He spilled his blood. He, he shed his blood. He, he, but he, notice it says, Jesus prophesied, you will all desert me. First prediction fulfilled, verse 50. But then he turns to Peter, who was the leader. And in verse 29, he says, Peter, you're going to deny me. But what does Peter say? Lord, even though they all fall away, <laughs> I will not. You see, Peter is perturbed by his own pride. Pride comes before fall, right? Amen? <laughs> In other words, he said, they, they might bail on you, Jesus, but, but he believes that he will never fail the Lord because, you know, all of us are prone to pride. I don't know about you, but we are. Let's be honest. Listen to these words, Proverbs 16 Verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 28, 26, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. Proverbs 29, 23, one's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, therefore let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Jesus tells him that he's going to do worse than the rest of them. <laughs> That's really what he says here in verse 30. Jesus said, Truly I tell you this very night before the rooster crows twice you're going to deny me three times. Yes, they will des desert Jesus one time, but Peter is going to deny Jesus three times before the sun comes up. But notice what Peter does. He proudly protests this prediction of Jesus. He says, and it's, the Bible says, he emphatically says the second time, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. But don't forget the last sentence there. <laughs> the Bible says they all said the same. <laughs> Every one of them. But a wonderful promise here. He predicts that those closest to him will desert him and deny him. But he says, but after I am raised up, hallelujah, after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. You see, this is the, the fifth or sixth prediction of Jesus' resurrection. I wonder if they could see the grace in his face as, as when he said he would, he would reconnect with them in Galilee and go before them like a shepherd leading his sheep. Folks, Jesus came for deserters. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus came for deniers. Jesus came for sinners, for strugglers, for the proud, for the pompous, for the reprehensible, for the rebellious, for the liars, for the lost. Jesus came. For those who bail and for those who fail, Jesus came for you, for me, for all of us. What a wonderful promise. After I'm raised up, I will go before you into Galilee. Well, just four quick, what I want to call communion correctives as we go into a time with the Lord's Supper and just after our hymn of response or invitation in just a few moments. But flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Later on, Paul writes a letter based on the Lord's Supper, the Lord Last Supper. And as far as we know, this memorial meal was celebrated with, with decorum, with dignity in the early church. We see it in the book of Acts chapter 2. 
until we get to what I want to call the, the chaotic and the confused church of Corinth. <laughs> it was a chaotic group of folks worshiping there in Corinth. You know, it, Corinth was an awful, evil city. These people who had been saved and formed the, the core of that church in Corinth, the early church, they were from awful backgrounds. And Paul is, is correcting some things here, and, and if you break into chapter 11 of, of uh, 1 Corinthians, and, and there at verse 23, he, he gives us some, some great words here. First of all, we come to this table this morning, and we're to look back. Everybody do this behind you. We're, we're, look, we're to look back. We're, we're to remember... Uh, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me. We already sang tonight, this morning. In remembrance. We're to look back. Notice that Paul says he received these instructions directly from Jesus. And twice in this passage we're told to remember this do in remembrance of me. We're to remember what Jesus has done for us. Folks, remember what Jesus has done for you. Because many of us have spiritual amnesia. <laughs> we need to look back. When we come to this table, let's look back at that cross and that death on our behalf. But also we're to, let's do this, we look forward. We're to look forward. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. Hallelujah. <laughs> We're going to proclaim the death of Jesus this morning till He comes. We're looking ahead. We're looking forward. Uh, we're, we're to look back, but we're to re and remember the cross. But we're to look for, we're to look to the crown. It says to proclaim means to announce. To we're announcing publicly. We're declaring. We're publishing. We're 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 perpetuating his death, the death of Jesus. The bread and the cup tell the story of redemption and help our faith to fast forward to that end of history. And we eat and drink now in anticipation of that great and glorious banquet that we're going <coughs> to celebrate. So we're to remember, but we're to rejoice. Somebody say rejoice. Yeah. Rejoice. We're going to be talking about that tonight. I hope you come back tonight. Rejoice. We're to remember. We're to rejoice. And then if you look at verses 27 and 28, he, wants, he says we need to look within. Look, point, everybody point here. Look within. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Once you remember, you look back. Once you rejoice, <laughs> looking forward to that day, that marriage supper of the Lamb, that we'll be there together around that table, Brother Jim, it's going to be wonderful. But we can't help but look inside and see the need in our hearts to, to repent. You see, repentance isn't a one-time thing. You, re, Repentance isn't just when you turn from your sin and knowledge that you're a sinner and that you can't save yourself and you turn and you put your faith in you. Repentance is a continual thing. 
That's what he's saying here. Paul is causing, cautioning us about approaching the Lord's table in a uh, stale or, or overused manner. We don't come to this table just uh, out of routine. This is a special time to look back, to look forward, but look inside. It's the word repent. <laughs> Somebody say repent. 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 If there's if there's something that's that's in your heart that shouldn't be there, repent. If there's some kind of relationship that's not right, repent. Repent. And then he says, look back, look forward. Look inside, and now let's do this. Look around. Look around. Can you take your hand? Don't hit, don't hit the person in front of you, but, but do it like this. Look around. Look around. Look around. Look around. That's what he's saying here. But let a man examine himself, let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup, for he who eats and drinks of it unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned in the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Let's make sure, brothers and sisters, that we're living in union with those that we're in co community with. You know, we could call this uh, communion our common union. <laughs> our common union here. Jesus has made us one. So we need to act accordingly. And back, back in chapter 10 verse 17, Paul puts it this way. For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partake of one bread. Shortly after this supper, Jesus poured out his life to the Father. And you know the number one thing that was on his mind? He prayed about it in John 17. He said, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they might be one, even as we are one. Brothers and sisters, we must be eager to maintain this oneness because unity can easily be unraveled. Someone said we're all susceptible to the disease called hardening of the categories. <laughs> Not hardening of the arteries, hardening of the categories where we think that our views are the only right ones. <laughs> Lord help us. The Bible says we are one in Christ. Every believer has the same salvation. We have the same spirit. We have the same scriptures. And so we are to guard. The Bible says that we're to guard. We, we can't create unity. God's already created. But we can guard the unity. We can maintain the unity. Communion is the great uniter because the ground at the foot of the cross is all level. Amen? And let me tell you, I will work at maintaining the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace in this church. And I, I, I trust and know that you will as well. Because the enemy will do anything he can to divide us. He will use petty, petty stuff. It's, it's happened over and over again. Brothers and sisters, we must guard the unity of the Spirit. We're all part of one body. No one is better than anyone else. 
Do, do, do you have any sins that you need to confess before you take the communion? Is there anyone you need to get settled with, to forgive? Is there anyone you need to extend forgiveness to? For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And because the Lord has done that, no other lamb ever needs to be sacrificed again. And it says, and when they finished, they sang a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives. And we're, we're going to do that in just a moment. It's quite likely they sang from Psalm 118. But what he's saying in these last words is, look around. Be reconciled. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to one another. That's what this is about. If you're here today and you've, you've never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you haven't been reconciled. You haven't applied that blood, what Jesus did on that cross for you. And this is your opportunity to do that. Would you stand with me? Father God, we thank you for this word today. We, we look back.